Good morning. Our discussion for today is Resiliency in Handling Healthcare Stress Among Medical Trainees. This is the second installment of my lecture on workplace ethics. And though this may sound different from the topics discussed in medical ethics course, this topic is equally important as you prepare for your initiation to the practice of medicine. Our objectives uh, for this discussion or for today's topic would be the following. First is to understand the peculiarities of healthcare setting in relation to workplace stress. And then to review the effects of stress to medical trainees and in healthcare workforce. Third is to revisit stress management. And lastly, to reintroduce the concept of resiliency as a tool in coping with stress. Healthcare setting is among the most stressful work environment. Its peculiarities have never been well discussed in medical education because it was presumed that all students of medicine have the unshakable determination, tenacity, and tolerance to all the hardship that goes with a training and actual profession. What makes health environment peculiar and stressful? First is the sustained emotionally tense situation. Dealing with people who are suffering from diseases, those who are dying and talking to their families can be psychologically and emotionally exhausting. As highly tense and busy and demanding workplace, conflicts among members of healthcare team are bound to happen. And the presence of difficult patients and their families that healthcare teams have to deal on every day without losing composure can also stretch human endurance. The second is the nature of the medical profession. Medical profession puts high premium on the acquisition of knowledge and skills at a very limited time. Medicine is a very exacting profession and trainees are expected to learn quickly and that mistakes are almost always not allowable. So there is this examination stress, our requirements to fulfill research and presentations, the competition among peers, the systems of referrals among departments, and the heavy consequences of wrong decision making. Medicine demands enormous responsibility but with a very low reward. Patients come to you expecting to get the cure and never for you to commit error. And then the nature of work plus the amount of workload is likewise daunting. As medical trainees, you are expected to learn as students and function as part of the hospital workforce. You are given the tasks that are new to you and you are expected to do it well at first try. Because illness occurs any time of the day, medical servicing is required 24-7. Thus, medical trainees are expected to give up sleep in favor of service. Holiday celebrations can be forfeited for the sake of work, and because of this, variety of social interaction is limited. This is heightened by the pandemic, and quarantine or isolation protocols were constantly imposed and, of course, bear so much restrictions on the mobility or social interactions of medical trainees. There is almost always a never-ending array of urgent situations in the hospital, and this sustained hyper-vigilant state may cause not only stress, but burnout. There is always that impression that those who go into medicine are made of stronger stuff. There is a high expectation on the stamina and endurance of medical trainees to the pressures that are being presented. The culture of survival of the fittest is an implied dictum for medical education and practice. Psychological distress is perceived to be a sign of weakness. Lastly, medical profession is not known for having established support system for physical and psychological distress among its ranks. It was only very recently that mental health was given attention to within healthcare environment. Again, I would like to mention that stress is not altogether counterproductive. 
we have what we call eustress or positive stress. And positive stress is also beneficial because it stimulates the acquisition of knowledge and skills. And it boosts self-confidence or develops self-confidence. And as we experience um, difficulties and hardling difficulties in life, our maturity also improves. And we, we can tolerate some sort of ambiguity or levels of ambiguity when we are used or have hurdled you stress by the daily basis. Distress or negative stress, on the other hand, may impact individuals and institution. In an individual, it interferes with effective and efficient learning. It may impair memory and problem-solving skills. It increases anxiety levels and it induces psychosomatic symptoms or exacerbations of illnesses. And of course, there's the propensity to burn out and not finishing the medical course. Distress or negative stress has also an impact on organization. On institutions, stress will affect indirectly the, as workers increases the chance to commit medical errors. And if there are medical errors, litigation process could also be faced by the hospital and the administration. And as workers uh, commit frequent mistakes, there would be poor quality patient care and thus would affect the reputation of the hospital or institution. Neuroscience has shown that stress can permanently destroy neurons of the brain that affect learning, reasoning, and impulse control, or even memory. That's why there's the need to always cope up and manage stress effectively. We have what we call occupational stress. And to be specific, when we talk about occupational stress, we refer to biological and psychological effects of negative interaction between work conditions and person's knowledge, skills, and expectations. Burnout, which occupies the farthest end of the, of the stress spectrum, is characterized by a triad of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, or treating patients as if they are just objects, and low productivity and assessment. While stress means over-engagement to certain situations, burnout is the disengagement. Stress makes a person overreactive, anxious, and hyperreactive, while burnout makes emotions blunted, or depressed, detached, and hopeless. The rate of burnout is higher in healthcare professionals. This data was taken a few years prior to pandemic. Currently, however, some studies have shown a tremendous increase, mainly attributable to COVID pandemic. The highest figure derived from recent study is 76%, meaning that 76% among healthcare practitioners have burnouts compared to the 27% in general population. Suicide rates are also higher among healthcare professionals than other population, subsets of population. This is the stress scores of trainees across fields of specialty. Surely some changes would have been observed during this pandemic also. Current data are still being investigated which suggests that internal medicine is gaining more points in the stress scales. Pre-pandemic, however, the specialty with the highest stress score is OBGYN, followed by surgery, then anesthesiology. So again, I would like to emphasize that stress is a part of everyday life. Just because we are in a stressful situation, it doesn't mean that we always have to get stressed out. We may be in a storm, but let us not allow the storm to be within us. As mentioned on my last lecture, the first thing that is helpful in managing stress is to identify the source of stress. And there are four A's, letter A's, in managing it. First is to avoid the necessary stress. There are so many things that stresses us out that we can do without. Or always avoid. Example, buying very expensive and unnecessary things 
which will make us agonize over paying for it when the bill billing time comes. Second is altering the situation. Conditions that can be modified in order to do away with stress should be considered. So while you are getting stressed over traveling from your residences to the workplace or school, then probably you can cut the stress over traveling by considering a halfway house. Third is by adapting to the stress. But just how do you adapt to stress? Well, you may reframe the problem. And reframing problem means viewing stressful situations from a more positive perspective. Like um, when you are caught in a traffic, consider this as an opportunity for you to pause, pray, and meditate. And then you should also learn to see the bigger picture. View the issue as how it will affect you in the long run. Understanding the need to sacrifice for your future and aspirations will help you adapt to your responsibilities more. Next is to adjust. Adjust your standards. Set reasonable standards with room for imperfection. This way, you will learn to accept your limitations and be realistic with your goals. Practice gratitude in everything. Find the good side in all situations. Last is accepting that there are things beyond your control. Instead of looking for the upside, or better view of the stressful situation. Then learn to forgive. You forgive others to achieve inner peace and serenity. You forgive yourself to unload your emotional burdens so that you can move forward. Share your feelings to trusted friends. Do this with discretion as bearing your own self in social media can bring more stress than relief. Know yourself more. Do not live your whole life trying to comply to the unreasonable and unrealistic expectations of others. Amidst the stress, burnout, and management of stress, one very important quality that you should always have or always to improve on is resilience. Resilience, by definition, is an attitude that enables the individual to examine, enhance, and utilize the strength, characteristics, and other resources available to manage and overcome the effects of stress. It is a response or set of methods used to successfully navigate through any perceived stressful event. Levels of resiliency changes and develops throughout, throughout a person's lifetime. This is among the most important psychological tools that a person should implement to feel normal again or the mechanism to protect against possibly overwhelming events. Resilience maintains the balance and acts as a protection against the development of mental health issues. Resilience can be enhanced by adverse, adverse event. And to be resilient is to become flexible to situational demands. It is trying to find out how to survive well and develop ways to cope up perceived unfavorable circumstances and experience. It is also the ability to bounce back from negative experiences and being able to learn from them, rising up again when you fall and regaining momentum when faced with, set with a setback is also resilience. This pandemic has taught us resilience among other things. It posed as a prolonged setback in every aspect of our lives. This experience should have developed in us the tenacity to pursue our goal through alternative routes and be creative in our utilization of whatever available resources there is. The ABC model of resilience illustrates that being, an adverse, being in an adverse situation can modify our belief system that can be transformative in nature. Adversity triggers formation of beliefs and belief system and is consequently translated to reactions and behavior. These are good examples of how to develop resiliency and therefore recovering readily from difficulties. First is possessing the will to keep on trying even it's difficult. Try and try until one succeeds. And then refuse to back out and complain when things don't work as expected. 
Next is making the most of one's spare time, either to become more productive or well-rested. And then preventing oneself to act impulsively and rashly. And of course, the resolve to change the things that can be altered while accepting also the things or the circumstances that cannot be changed. Why is resilience or resiliency important? One, it improves learning and academic achievement. It is resiliency that renders a person to be tenacious, to pursue knowledge amidst difficulties and frustration. Second, resilience lower absences from work and study because it lends individuals the optimism needed to go on with the task despite challenges and setbacks. Therefore, as resiliency leads the person to become hopeful and optimistic in his struggles, his feeling of despair and misery can be buffered, and because of this, mental health issues and psychosomatization can be avoided. Also, resilience reduces risk-taking behaviors such as substance abuse and sexual experimentations. As the person becomes more focused on getting back to his tracks and thinking of better or more effective ways to cope, substance abuse, sexual experimentations, and other risk-taking behaviors can be avoided. Resilient people are more socially engaged, be it within the family or community. The strength to carry out provides confidence and willingness to help others. As resiliency lowers the occurrence and high, of high degree of stress and burnout, the rates of morbidity and mortality are also lowered. Resilience is also believing that adversity is temporary and it is meant to be dealt with in order to survive it. So what are the types of resilience? First is inherent resilience or the natural born resilience. Every person is born with its own temperament, and each temperament has a corresponding response, natural response to stress, which we term as resilience. Adaptive resilience is exemplified by having to go through your 24 hours duty while you are in a process of engaging it. So this is brought about by difficult and challenging experiences that need to be learned on the spot to develop the ability in managing stress and pain. Learned resilience. Learned resilience is built over time and it is activated through difficult circumstances in the past. Through these, persons learn, grow, and develop mechanisms to manage and find strength to overcome new challenging and stressful events. So as you already have survived your 24 hours hospital duties during your clerkship, this will give you enough encouragement, optimism, and confidence to survive as well your postgraduate internship and then residency training. Several key elements to the development of resilience. First is the emotional factor. Emotional factor is the positive and optimistic outlook, self-control, stamina, and good character of a person. This also includes the emotional calm and balance even in the presence of pressures. Second is the spiritual factor. This is, these are the strong set of beliefs, values, and principles that the person may have that would help him sustain stress. Vision gives sense of value to activities and actions. Therefore, this also affects the determination and the effort of a person to overcome obstacles in order to achieve the goals that the person would want to achieve. There is nothing more resilient in this earth than the human spirit. It drives every individual to survive tragedies and life-changing experiences. It brought success even amongst the most adverse condition. Jews survived the Holocaust and became a thriving independent nation in the middle of an adversarial neighboring states. Japan rose to become an economic power following bankruptcy during the Second World War. And the list goes on and on. And as we say in our own, matira ang matibay. Another element of resiliency is the social factor. Building positive relationships provide positive emotions, and among which is sense of self 
and self-confidence. Self-acceptance is not based on results or performance, but it is about acknowledging that success and failings are tools to improve oneself. Trusted and positive relationships are personally fulfilling, and this gives us the opportunity to create reciprocity through giving appropriate responses and assisting each other's needs. So we are a part of a greater ecosystem or macrocosm. And we should be reaching out and connect with each other because no man is an island. And we cannot stay in our corner of the forest and wait, uh, wait for others to come to us. We have to go to them most of the time or sometimes. Family is the basic unit of the society. And being part of the unit that is safe, supportive, loving, would provide all the resources needed for all the members to live in a healthy and secure environment. Experiences from family can be the most edifying or the most punitive and damaging. So whatever problem, stress, and pain that a person has can be made more bearable by the presence of a family. Last is physical. And physical factor or element of resilience is uh, the commitment, no? Is, is being improved as we commit to our own physical constitution or to improve our own physical constitution. And it takes self-control to maintain physical well-being. So yes, healthy body promotes resiliency and we should be committed to maintain both. When we are physically healthy, we have better mood control. Our emotions are likely positive. Healthy body raises self-confidence and self-beliefs. We should strive to create in us a sort of a positive shield that cancels out undesirable emotions and actions directed towards us. Life always presents to us difficult people and circumstances. If we have the resiliency and this resiliency shield, we can have the power to protect ourselves from getting discouraged and be paralyzed by difficulties around us. So there are 10 ways to build resilience. First is to avoid seeing crises as insurmountable or beyond solving. Stressful events always happen, and it is how you interpret and respond that matters. Second is accept that change is a part of living. We change to cope, and we cope with the change. Believe that problems and difficulties are meant to teach us something valuable, even as we are still in the process of finding solution and move towards your goal, realistic goal. Even baby steps towards the direction of your goal is as important. Then keep things in proper perspective by not blowing out painful events out of proportion. Have the courage to continue. After all, success is never final and neither is failure. Look for opportunities for self-discovery. Do something, do something for self-discovery. Develop, develop strength in adversity or stronger faith in tragedies or heightened appreciations in hardship. Then take decisive actions. Do not detach yourself completely from problems and stress, wishing that they will magically disappear. Nurture a positive view of self and then develop that self-confidence and belief capable of solving problems. Maintain Hopeful, a hopeful outlook, and be optimistic. Visualize your aspirations rather than worrying over your fears. Interconnections or interconnectedness keeps us grounded and comforted, so continue making that connections. And lastly, never forget to love and take care of yourself. Pay attention to your own needs and feelings and engage in enjoyable and relaxing activities. Taking care of yourself helps to keep your mind and body primed to deal with situations that may require resilience. Find humor in all life circumstances. When confronted with stressful situation, you have the option of either to fight, take a flight, or just take a breather and recoup. So the bottom line is, never give in to the cold burn. Cold burn is any situation that started out as important, meaningful, and challenging, 
but ended up as unfulfilling and meaningless. While resilience gives energy, compassion, and efficacy, burnout gives a feeling of exhaustion and cynicism and ineffectiveness. What won't kill you will make you stronger. So just go on. Take those steps towards the goal, even though that it can be as hard as you think and as hard uh, that you can bear. Resilience is remember that you are good enough and that everyone is different. So stop comparing yourself because individuality rocks. Learn something new daily and involve yourself in what you love doing. Enjoy things that makes you happy. And not everyone can be first, second, or third. So you're just okay in your own special way. Care about yourself and others. Expect that some days won't be as great as you expect them to be. So just bear and go on. Never fail to bounce back whenever and whatever situation you are thrown in. Life is a series of ups and downs, and this is why you need always to bounce. So go find your rubber ball. You need it as you navigate through internship, clerkship, and even your medical practice later on. With this, I end my lecture, and thank you very much for your kind listening.